when death was not yet. We've been following a couple of books, a Genesis creation account and its reverberations in the Old Testament, and he spoke and it was Divine Creation in the Old Testament, both uh, edited by Joel Klingbeil, uh, published last year. And um, there's the covers of the two books. And uh, they both have to do with uh, th how the rest of the Old Testament views Genesis, but also um, some overview stuff. And this is uh, one of the overview chapters. It's uh, chapter 10, which is entitled, When Death Was Not Yet, The Testimony of Biblical Creation. It's written by Jacques Ducan, uh, who is at Andrews University. And um, the chapter begins, the question of the origin of death is interpreted differently depending on whether one holds to the theory of evolution or the biblical story of creation. So he's basically giving you a contrast here. While evolution teaches on the basis of observation that death is a natural and necessary process in the hard struggle for life, Death is a part of life. The Bible tells us, on the contrary, that death was not a part of the original plan. So that's the assertion that he's going to support now. From the testimony of biblical creation, four arguments can be used to support this assertion. The world was originally created good, number one. Number two, the created world was therefore not yet affected by death. Number three, death was not planned. And number four, death will no longer be in the new recreated world of the eschatological hope, implying that there's no reason for it not to have been. In fact, there's good reason uh, for it to have been absent from the original creation. Now, he's going to give a methodological note, although my question is theological and philosophical, and I might add it's also scientific. Was death a part of God's original creation? Uh, my approach to finding the answer will be essentially exegetical. This means that I will seek within the biblical text literary clues suggesting that not only was death not a part of God's creation, but also that the biblical text attests to a specific intentionality about this assumption. So he's going to basically take the Bible and ask, what does the Bible say? And for him, uh, that's adequate. The good of creation... The use of the verb bara, to create, to describe God's creation and the regular refrain, it was good, for example, in Genesis 1-4, but there are several other examples, of course, to qualify his work, testify to the goodness of creation. The verb bara, the, the divine work of creation is rendered throughout, pardon me, is rendered through the use of the verb bara, which is often used in parallel with Asa, to do, to make. And you can see some examples there where it says to make and to create together. Implying a positive connection, connotation that is on the opposite range of meanings to the negative ideas of destruction and death. In addition, the root bara denotes the concept of producing something new, which has nothing to do with a former condition. And there's some quotes there. Um, the last one, Isaiah 55, 65, 17, you may remember is, Behold, I create all things new. Or, pardon me, um, that's Revelation, actually. Uh, it's, Behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth. Um, and marvels which have never been seen before, such as in Exodus 34, 10. This usage of the verb bara does not, therefore, allow the sense of separating, which has sometimes been advocated, and I was doing some reading and noticing and that, uh, that uh, if you look up Bara in Blue Letter Bible, and I think Anasius' commentary, it does discuss the idea of separating. Um, for the simple reason, it does not allow that kind of interpretation, for the simple reason that this interpretation does not take the following arguments into consideration. The semantic argument, although, Genesis, although the Genesis creation story contains a series of separations, this does not mean that the Hebrew verb bara means separate. 
If it were the case, why did the biblical author choose to use the verb bara seven times in the creation narrative? And uh, there's the list. Um, instead of the specific word, hibdil, to separate, which is used in the same context when the idea of separation is really intended. Hibdil is used for, you know, divide the day from the night, divide the waters which are above the firmament from the waters which are below the firmament, and so forth. There's a logical argument. The other bi the biblical occurrences of the verb bara would not make sense if the verb was translated separate instead of create. See, especially Genesis 121, Exodus 30.10, Deuteronomy 4.32, and Isaiah 45.12. Also the fact that the verb bara has only God as a subject, whereas the verb hibdil, to separate, generally has humans as subjects, testifies to the fundamental difference of meaning between the two verbs. A syntactical argument. The use of the same emphatic particle of the accusative et after the verb bara. Introducing one or several objects implies the same syntactical relationship between them and thus supports the interpretation of create rather than separate, which implies different syntactical relations with the use of a different set of prepositions. Bain, ubain, that is, uh, between the light and between the darkness is the way the, uh, the uh, uh, phrase would be found in, in the first day. Um, or min and lay, from something to something else. And the idea is that separate requires two things that are separated. Whereas to create only requires one thing. And uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to, uh, uh, to have something, to separate something from itself. Uh, and, and it would be even more odd if you said separate something and then you didn't say from, even from itself, you just said separate it. There's a linguistic argument, the argument that the verb bara is related to the rare PL form of a root, which if it were in uh, the call form would be bara, only it would be bire, it's a PL form, which has the meaning of separate or divide to support the interpretation of separate is hardly defensible since this verb is derived from a different root. Um, uh, it's numbered three in the uh, in the uh, Near Eastern or uh, Semitic uh, uh, vocabulary, whereas uh, bara is, of course, the number one root. Um, and. By the way, they're quoting uh, Kohler and Baumgartner, which is one of the more authoritative uh, commentaries there. Now, as I read that, obviously Dukan is arguing against some people that are trying to say bra doesn't mean create at all. And that, uh, for many of you, I think would be beating a dead horse, but uh, there are some who think that horse has life in it, and so he's taking care of that. Um, Ancient Near Eastern argument. In ancient Egypt, as well as in Mesopotamia, the divine operation of creation is similarly rendered by the terms create, make, build, and form, but never by the word, verb separate or divide. So other stories require that. The translation argument. The Septuagint translates the verb bara. So this is the opinion of scholars of 150 BC generally by ketizo, which is the Greek create, 17 times, and poeo, or make, which is 15 times. Uh, notice that poeo also would translate uh, asa, to make or do. And if you're wondering, yes, a poet is somebody who makes things. Um, but never by separate or divide. And there are equivalent Greek Greek verbs. Um, the refrain, it was good, 
The divine work of creation is at each stage of its progress unambiguously characterized as tov, or good, and at the end of the last step as tov meod, or very good, in Genesis 1.31. The um, meaning of the Hebrew verb tov needs to be clarified here. Indeed, the Hebrew idea of good is more t total and comprehensive than what is implied in the English translation. Although, to be fair, the English verb it, uh, word itself has a fairly wide uh, variety of uses. It should not be limited to the idea of function, meaning that the, only the efficiency of operation is intended here. Yeah, it's a good car, it moves. Uh, rather, the, ver the word tov may also refer to aesthetic beauty. And there's some examples, especially when it is associated with the word ra'a, to see, as in the case of the, as is the case in the creation story. That is, you see that it is good, that implies that it has aesthetics that are good as well. The word tov may also have an ethical connotation. And in fact, when it's used in contrast with ra, which is evil, as the, uh, as the tr a tree of knowledge of good and evil, it's obviously uh, ethical. A sense that is also attested in our context of the creation story, especially in God's recognition. It is not good that man should be alone. That's an ethical opinion. Um, this divine statement clearly implies a relational dimension, including ethics, aesthetics, and even love and emotional happiness, as the immediate context suggests. This divine evaluation is particularly significant as it appears to be in direct co connection to the first creation story, which was deemed good. In the second creation story, the, verb, the word tov appears five times, thus playing the role of a key word in response to the seven occurrences of tov in the first, of the first creation story. This echo between the two creation stories by means of the, verb, the word tob sheds light on the meaning of that word. While lo tov, not good, alludes negatively to the perfect and complete creation of the first creation story, the phrase tob vera, or good and bad, or good and evil, as it's traditionally translated, the word in its contrary suggests that the word tov, good, should be understood as expressing a distinct and different notion from ra, bad or evil. The fact that creation was good means then that it contained no evil. The reappearance of the same phrase in Genesis 3.22 will confirm th this argument from another perspective. The knowledge of good and evil, suggesting discernment or knowing the difference between right and wrong, was only possible when, quote, Adam was like one of us in regard to the distinguishing between good and evil. The verb haya, was, is a perfect form and refers to a past situation. It is only when Adam was like God, not having sinned yet from the perspective of pure evil, that Adam was able to distinguish between good and evil. Now, I'll have to say here, that I'm, I don't find this particular thing completely persuasive. I do think he is right about Adam is like, should be really including the past tense, um, Adam was like one of us, uh, implying that Adam actually knew good, uh, to distinguish good and evil before he ever ate of the fruit, which is a interesting little twist on, what, on how it's usually done, but I'm not sure that you can go from that to say he no longer is, which is what uh, Dukan appears to be able to be saying. But uh, we'll get back to that and we'll throw it open for your discussion. Uh, the same line of reasoning may be perceived somewhat in a parallel way in, the issue of, in regard to the issue of death which is in our context immediately related to the issue of the knowledge of good and evil. Indeed, the tree of life is associated with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, as they are located at the same place 
in the midst of the garden. And Adam is threatened with the loss of life as soon as he fails to distinguish between good and evil. Um, for just as good without evil is the only way to be saved from evil, life without death is the only antidote to death. Uh, think about that one hard. It is also noteworthy that this divine appreciation of good does not concern God. Unlike the Egyptian stories of creation, which emphasize that a God created only for his own good, for his own pleasure, and that his progeny was only accidental, the Bible insists that the work of creation was deliberately intended for the benefit of God's creation and especially designed for the good of humans. God created this for us. Indeed, the two parallel texts of creation in Genesis 1 and 2 teach that perfect peace reigned initially. In both texts, humankind's relationship to nature is described in the positive terms of ruling and responsibility. In Genesis 1, 26 and 28, the verb rada, to rule, to have dominion, which is used to express humankind's relationship to animals, is a term that belongs to the language of the suzerain vassal covenant and of royal dominion without any connotation of abuse or cruelty. And we've come across that before. We'll come back to that later. In the parallel text of Genesis 2, humankind's relationship to nature is also described in the positive terms of covenant. Humankind gives names to the animals and thereby not only indicates the establishment of a covenant between humankind and them, but also declares lordship over them. That death and suffering are not part of this relationship is clearly suggested in Genesis 1 by the fact that this dominion is immediately associated with food, which is designated to both humans and animals. It is just the product of plants. In Genesis 2, the same harmony is conveyed by the fact that animals are designed to provide companionship for humans. At this point in the story, humankind's relationship to God has not suffered any disturbance. The perfection of this relationship is suggested through a description of that relationship only in positive terms. Genesis 1 mentions that humankind has been created in the image of God. And Genesis 2 reports that God was personally involved in creating humans and breathed into them the breath of life. Likewise, the relationship between man and woman is blameless. The perfection of a conjugal unity is indicated by mentioning that humankind has been created in Genesis 1 as male and female, and in Genesis 2, through Adam's statement about his wife being bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. The whole creation is described as perfect, unlike the ancient Egyptian tradition of origins, which implies the presence of evil already at the stage of creation. The Bible makes no room for, re for evil in the original creation. Significantly, at the end of the work, the very idea of perfection is expressed through, through the word wayakol, Oh, that should be why you call, I'm sorry. Uh, Genesis 2, 1 and 2, qualifying the whole creation. This Hebrew word, which is generally translated finished or completed, conveys more than the mere chronological idea of end. It also implies the quantitative idea that nothing is missing and there is nothing to add. Again, confirming that death and all evil were totally absent from the picture. Sounds like he's arguing and and I would support that, that uh, it's sort of like the difference between a teleao uh, in Greek and uh, plerao, which is to fill, to, fill, uh, to complete, um, but completed in a, in a whole sense rather than just uh, got it done type of sense. Furthermore, the biblical text does not allow for the speculation of a pre-creation involving death and destruction. The echoes between introduction and conclusion indicate that the creation referred to in the conclusion is the same as the one mentioned in the introduction. The heavens and the earth, which are mentioned in Genesis 2, 4a, at the conclusion of the creation story are the same as in Genesis 1, 1, the introduction in the creation story. The echoes between the two framing phrases are significant. The 
in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then the conclusion, the, this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created. And you can see the parallelism between the two. The fact that the same verb bara created is used to designate the act of creation and with the same object, heavens and earth, suggests that the conclusion points to the same act of creation as introduction. In fact, this phenomenon of echoes goes even beyond these two lines. Genesis 2, 1 through 3 echoes Genesis 1, 1 by using the same phrase but in reverse order. It starts, Genesis 1, 1 is created God, the heavens and the earth, literally. I mean, uh, in English we always tra uh, translate it in the beginning God created, but that's because English won't tolerate created God. In, in Hebrew, it is Bereshith bara Elohim Hashemayim v'ha'aretz, which literally is in the beginning created God, the heavens and the earth. And that reappears in Genesis 2, 1 through 3 as in reverse. Heavens and earth, verse 1, God, verse 2, and created in verse 3. So I guess you'd call that a chiasm. This chiastic structure and the inclusion of God, God created, linking Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 2-3, reinforce the close connection between the two sections in the beginning and the end of the text, again confirming that the creation referred to at the end of the story is the same as the creation referred to in the beginning of the story. The end of creation found in Genesis 1-1 and 2-4a is then told as a complete event, which does not complement a pre-work in a far past, as the gap theory would require, nor is it to be complemented in a post-work of the future, as evolutionary theory would require. The not yet of creation. <clears throat> it seems, in fact, that the whole Eden story has been written from the perspective of a writer who already knows the effects of death and suffering, and therefore describes these events of Genesis 2 as a not yet situation. Significantly, the word terem, or not yet, is stated twice in the introduction of the text to set the tone for the whole passage. And further in the text, the idea of not yet is indeed implicitly indicated. The afar, or dust, from which humankind has been formed in 2.7 anticipates the sentence of chapter 3, to dust you shall return. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil anticipates the dilemma of humankind later confronted with the choice between good and evil in chapter 3, verses 2 and 6. The assignment given to humankind was to shamar, to keep the garden in its original state, which implies the risk of losing it. Therefore, anticipating God's decision in Genesis 3 to chase them out of the garden and to entrust the keeping, or shamar, of the garden to the cherubim. And the cherubim were stationed there to keep, literally, shamar, the garden. The same word shamar is used in both passages showing the bridge between them, the former pointing to the latter suggesting the not yet situation. Likewise, the motif of shame in Genesis 2.25, or to be precise, no shame, um, they were naked and were not ashamed, points to the shame they will experience later in Genesis 3, and Adam said, because I was ashamed. The same idea is intended through the play on words between arom, naked, and arum, cunning, uh, which is actually only different in the pointed vowels, in the he pointed Hebrew. In the original consonants, you can't tell the difference. Um, the former is also a prolepsis and points forward to the latter to indicate that the tragedy which will be initiated through the association between the serpent and human beings has not yet occurred. Indeed, as Walsh notes, there's a frequent occurrence of prolepsis in the Eden account. Death was not planned, the reversal of creation. The biblical text goes on in Genesis 3 to tell us that an unplanned event happened and reversed the original picture of peace into a picture of conflict. Conflict between animals and humans, between man and woman, between nature and humans, and finally, with humans against God. 
Death made, makes its first appearance since an animal was killed in order to cover humankind's nakedness. And death is now clearly profiled on the horizon of humankind. The blessing of Genesis 1 and 2 has been replaced with a curse. Indeed, the original ecological balance has been upset and the only, only the new incident of the sin of humankind is to be blamed for this. This theological observation is also reflected in the literary connection between the biblical texts. It is indeed significant that Genesis 3 is only telling the events that reversed creation. The story of Genesis 3 is also written in the reversed order of the story of Genesis 2 following the movement of the chiastic structure ABC, C prime, B prime, A prime. And uh, here's the chiastic structure itself. You start out with in Genesis 2, 5 through 8, settlement, and then you have life, and then you have union, and in C prime you have separation between the man and the woman, and then death, and then finally expulsion, or at least the uh, curse of death. The correspondence between the sections is also supported by the use of common Hebrew words and expressions. This literary reversal of motifs, settlement, expulsion, life, death, union, separation, confirms the intention of the biblical author, namely that sin provoked the reversal of the original creation. Later, this is the same principle that is behind the eruption of the flood, since a cosmic disruption is directly related to the iniquity of humankind. Skip a little bit. More particularly, the picture of the harmonious relationship between humankind and animals depicted in Genesis 1 is again disrupted after the flood. The literary bridge between the two passages indicates that the relationship was upset after, a cre after the creation and is not a natural part of it. Among a number of common motifs, the same concern with relationship between humankind and animals can be found. The parallelism is striking. And Here's the Genesis 1, 28 through 30, and, Gen and Genesis 9, 1 through 4. God blessed humankind. He said to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, and those are identical verbiage. He said, have dominion over all the animals. And, uh, and then, in the case 1, he gives food for humankind plants, and in the case the other case he gives food for humankind to be the animals. The parallelism works not only in the fact that both passages use the same words and motifs, but also in the fact that these occur in the same sequence. No doubt the connection between the two passages is intended. One important difference, however, concerns the relationship between humankind and animals. Although it is packed with the same ingredients, humankind, animals, beasts, birds, and fish, and food given by God, the nature of this relationship has changed. While in Genesis 1, humankind's relationship to animals is peaceful and respectful, in Genesis 9, it is made of fear and dread on the part of every beast which is given into your hand. The reason for this change is suggested in the text. Since the peaceful relationship in Genesis 1 is associated with the herbal food for humankind, and the conflict relationship in Genesis 9 is associated with the animal food, the conclusion may be drawn that this is the dietary change, the killing of animals, that has affected the humankind-beast relationship. In other words, the picture of conflict is not understood to be original and natural, but is the result of an ecological imbalance, which is due essentially to death. The fact that humans, as well as animals, started hunting. Uh, I'll come back to that because I have a small problem with that particular statement. Um, it is noteworthy that the consumption of herbal food was a part of creation, as death was not implied at that stage. This is confirmed by the second Genesis creation story, which specifies that the eating of fruit preceded and therefore excluded the appearance of death. The biblical view of death. It is significant that the overwhelming majority of occurrences of the technical word for death, moot, refers to human beings, rarely applies to animals, and is never used for plants per se. Um, there's probably one partial, well, actually even that one demonstrates the difference. Uh, the same perspective is reflected in the use of the word nefesh, 
which if you're reading the King James, it's usually translated soul. And man became a living soul. Nefesh Haya. Um, whose departure is the equivalent of death, which also applies generally to humans, sometimes to animals, but never to plants. The reason for this emphasis on human death versus animals and plants is, lies in the biblical concern for human salvation and the place of human consciousness and human responsibility in the cosmic destiny. Death is related to human sin, as noted in Romans 6.23, and sin belongs essentially to the human sphere. It is significant that the first and last appearances of death in the history of humankind are, in the Bible, associated with human sin and human destiny. The old lesson that no man is an island is invariably registered in the pages of the Bible. With all the responsibility and the tragic destiny this organic connection implies for humankind. Thus the biblical view of death is essentially different from the one proposed by evolution. While the belief in evolution implies that death is inextricably intertwined with life and therefore has to be accepted and eventually managed, the biblical teaching of creation implies that death is an absurdity to be feared and rejected. Skipping a little bit there, the Hebrew view of death was unique in the ancient Near East. While the Canaanites and the ancient Egyptians normalized or denied death through the myths of the gods of death, Moth and Osiris, the biblical, uh, pardon me, the Bible, by the way, Moat simply means death in, in Hebrew, so it's kind of, kind of interesting what's happened there. Um, the Bible confronts death and utters an existential shout of revolt and a sigh of yearning. And uh, he quotes Job and also uh, Romans. For the biblical authors, death is a contradiction to the creator God, who is pure life. The expression God, or the Lord, is alive, high, is one of the most frequently used phrases about God. And if you're wondering, wait a minute, I never heard that phrase. You actually have. You, uh, if you're reading the King James, it's mostly uh, translated, as the Lord lives. As the Lord liveth by, uh, before whom I stand. Holiness, which is the fullness of life, is incompatible with death. In the Mosaic Law, the blood was forbidden to be consumed precisely because the life of the flesh is in the blood. Leviticus 17.11, see also Genesis 9.4, Corpses were considered unclean, and any person who had been in contact with death would become unclean for seven days, and for that period of time would be cut off from the sanctuary and the people of Israel. Priests who were consecrated to God were even forbidden to go near a dead person. They were prohibited from entering a graveyard or attending a funeral unless it was for a close relative. All these commandments and rituals were meant to affirm life and to signify the Hebrew attitude towards death as an intruder and the result of sin. Raises an interesting question, what did the Hebrew priests do um, during a battle? But, uh, when death shall be no more, an argument from the future. It should not come as a surprise then that the biblical prophets understood hope and salvation as a total recreation of a new order where humankind and nature will enjoy God's last reversal where creation will be totally good again and no longer affected by sin and where death will be no more. In this new order, good will no longer be mixed with evil as death will no longer be mixed with life. It will be an order where the glory of God occupies the whole space. As Irving Greenberg points out, in the end, therefore, death must be overcome. God will destroy death forever. My Lord God will wipe the tears from every face. Isaiah 25, 8. Those are his ellipses, by the way, uh, probably Dukan's. In fact, since God is all good and all life, ideally there should, have, there should have been no death in God's creation in the first place. So this is somebody else who obviously agrees with Dukan, and I might add myself in that, in that opinion. The hope for the new creation of heavens and earth where death shall be no more provides us from the future with an additional confirmation that death was not part of God's original creation. Summary and conclusion, the biblical story of origins teaches that death was not a part of the original creation. 
for four fundamental reasons provided by the biblical testimony of creation. Number one, death was not part of creation because the story qualifies creation as good, that is, without any evil. And the unspoken uh, corollary is, of course, that death is evil. Death was not yet because the story is characterized as a not yet situation from the perspective of someone whose condition is already affected by death and evil. Death was due to human sin, which resulted in a reversal of God's original intention for creation. Therefore, no sin, no death. And finally, death was not intended to be a part of God's creation. original creation is evidenced. I'm sorry, that death was not intended to be a part of God's original creation is evidenced in the future recreation of the heavens and earth where death will be absent. The close literary reading of the Genesis text suggests that there is even a deliberate intention to emphasize these reasons to justify the absence of death at creation. In the first creation story in Genesis 1, 1 to 2a, the sevenfold repetition of the verb of the word tov, meaning good, reached it, reaching its seventh sequence in tov meod, or very good. In the Second creation story, the twofold repetition of the, of the word terem, not yet, and the prolepsis anticipating the not yet of Genesis 3. In the story of the fall in Genesis 3, the literary reversal expressing the cosmic reversal of creation. The tendency of the scientific community to assume that death was part of the original creation is understandable on the basis of present observations it is indeed impossible to conceive of life without death, just as it would be philosophically impossible to conceive of good without evil. Well, I would beg to differ on that. I think you can conceive of it, but it may be hard. Only the imagination of faith that takes us supernaturally beyond this reality allows us to transcend and even negate our condition. Only the visceral intu intuition of eternity, the life granted by God to all of us, he has put eternity in their hearts. And the imagination of faith help us to see beyond the reality of our present condition to realize that death has indeed nothing to do with life. Now, that's the end of his chapter. My take is that uh, I think Dukan makes a very good case that the author of Genesis and the other biblical writers envisioned the creation not to have contained death as they defined it. I think Dukan is less convincing that Adam lost the ability to distinguish between good and evil or that humans started hunting after the flood or even that Radah has no hint of cruelty. To take the first one, uh, the 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 tree is labeled the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and you eat it and it seems like you gain some kind of knowledge and perhaps you could say you gain experiential knowledge of evil and perhaps you could say that maybe you lose a little something but the I, I don't see the text being able to be read as well Adam had the knowledge already and then he ate the fruit and he lost it because that then you would have to name the tree something different. Um, I, uh, I also have trouble with saying that humans started hunting after the flood. I rather suspect that humans uh, hunted as well as did all kinds of other evil things before the flood, and that's why the flood um, happened. And, in, and in particularly, we have evidence of animals hunting before the flood. They certainly have the equipment to do so, and in some cases uh, you can find um, an animal with another animal in its stomach, um, implying that they did actually hunt before the flood. And so I think what happened at the flood was that humans were given permission to hunt animals, rather than that they actually started hunting them at that point. And, uh, uh, I mean, after all, we were not t given permission to kill, but Cain killed anyway. And, and so 
I think that uh, one has to be careful of getting carried away by uh, uh, by some ideas. And the same way that Radha does can have cruelty because it talks about people who rule cruelly, which means that Radha, at least in that case, could be cruel. And the question is, does Radha normally have cruelty, the ruling? And uh, I, I think the ideal Radha doesn't, and I would agree with him on that. But I think that uh, that you have to persuade. Uh, you have to proceed carefully uh, lest you start. Now, to be fair to him on the last one, the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament has an article that actually says that. But I think the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament is wrong on that, just like it's wrong on a few other things. Um, and frankly, you know, if somebody tries to tell me that the sky is, is green, um, I don't care how many academic degrees they have behind them. Um, it's not. And I have a right to say so. But I think on the major point that humans and apparently animal death were not part of the original creation um, is clearly assumed by the author of Genesis. I think Dukan is right about that. Now, I could have wished that Dukan would have addressed the limits of the animal kingdom. And, uh, for example, do bacteria qualify as animals? Do ants? Do fish? Um, we're going to have to envision an entirely different ecosystem. What about krill? Um, whales seem to eat them in great numbers. Uh, they seem to be the easiest thing to eat without... Um, killing larger animals. Um, were those baleen originally intended to filter out algae? Um, but to be fair to Dukan, he's not a biologist, and those kinds of questions might not occur to him. Um, and if they did, he might be right to assume that they were beyond his uh, area of expertise. Um, Dukan did not address the changes in lions, which are in scripture. And again, that may be a good thing because I don't know how, how, uh, 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 how much expertise Dukan has in, in uh, biology. Um, but those are subjects that might be addressed uh, here. And uh, anyway, uh, that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. We have a question right over here. I must say you've touched on an aspect that has been extremely puzzling to me from a medical standpoint and which I don't recall hearing discussed much before. So I start out by expressing very great personal appreciation for this topic, which sounds perhaps superficially at first rather superficial and pointless, but uh, I see it as profound and perhaps pervasive of the whole issue. Um, this business of defined death from a medical standpoint and those of us who have um, any, certainly an extensive background in pathology and knowledge of uh, metabolism uh, and one-celled animals and now on the molecular level, everything eats everything or consumes or is taken up by and changed by uh, and it all Indeed, dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return with all the molecular changes and munchings and changes of stomachs in between. Uh, that you have made a distinction, between, even that includes plants, as far as it's, it just seems like um, 
when you eat a leaf, that does the same thing as an animal eating another small animal. Uh, it's the biology of the process involved in digestion and metabolism is essentially comparable anyway. It's always seemed and therefore has certain, has a kind of philosophical and theological implications and extrapolations that you can draw from that. And that has always bothered me. Um, it would seem if you, if I, if you can conclude that, then there was such a thing as death before the fall. Because I would suppose that metabolism occurred as we, as we rather know it nowadays, certainly on a molecular level, even before the fall. And uh, the very process of eating plants involves, uh, by my broad definition, as I've just instinctively used it, a death of the plant. We refer to a tree as dying and the thing wills, but uh, is that in, to be in distinction from taking a leaf and munching on it and the tree stays alive? The leaf dies, or does the tree itself stay alive? Uh, and therefore, the, the death issue has not entered. Well, it has in terms of the leaf. <clears throat> I'm really being very prolix about this, but uh, that I can't be other than that because of the complexity and the profundity and all pervasion of the concept. Um, but I'll shorten it by saying that if you have introduced Hebrew into this, which of course I don't know, and it sounds like you do, Some. <laughs> at least enough of it, and uh, for that, I am extremely grateful. Uh, the whole thing may be resolved by the difference in Hebrew words that one imply, does not imply death. Uh, did I understand you correctly to say that? Uh, the, say the consumption of herbs before the fall, as it was originally intended, it was described in the original Hebrew with a word that did not imply death, whereas uh, the actual death of the human being, for example, after sin, another word was entirely used. Uh, if, that, if that is the case, and if that's what you're trying to tell us, uh, then I think it does solve a lot, at least it does to my thinking. Well, it's actually... Uh, the verb, the the verb uh, mawet or or mot, uh, the, the the noun mot, actually I should say, which is death itself. And the the verb is very closely related to it. Um, is uh, is used in um, is used in Job ten. And I think that's the one example where it looks like it refers to a plant and it refers to a tree that is cut down and interestingly it says and it dies but if there's a little bit of something left it'll shoot shoots up again um, but man when that happens to him he's done um, and so even where it does use the word, uh, the word for death in, uh, in, in referring to plants, it implies that it's not really death. Now, if we were being technical uh, scientists, we would say, well, yeah, but some trees do completely die. They get eaten up by termites or whatever, and there's nothing left to make shoots. Um, and so... And so we wouldn't phrase it that way, but in the biblical way of, you know, in Job's way of looking at it anyway, uh, his, he's, he's envisioning the trees that don't really quite die somehow. They, they, they keep... Gray area. May I interrupt? Yeah. Uh, Christ himself, it just now occurred to me, at least in the King James Version, and then here again, if you know about... Greek, because the King James was the New Testament was in Greek rather than Latin, right. Hebrews. 
he refers to the seed, except the seed die. It cannot live. That's always been a rather confusing kind of syntax to me. Would you elaborate on that? Well, I think the thought there is that the seed uh, becomes inert and gets buried. Well, yes, of course, uh, you can kind of wiggle around it by saying it comes inert, but it is hardly dies. But he, but then King James, uh, that's the word that's well, used. Right. It's the same well, word that, the th the I, that will apply to me in three or four right. years uh, to be when fair, I go under. Yeah, well, to, to be fair, and I think this is important, uh, what Dukan is looking at is not how we should view these things scientifically. What Dukan is looking at is how did the biblical authors envision? Oh yes. <laughs> and so, and so, and, and, and I back, agree with we're you. Back I think to we square have one again, and so we'll leave it. I think we have to wrestle with those questions. How do we interpret them scientifically? Uh, but I think that we have to be careful mm. not to import our scientific ideas prematurely into the biblical text. <clears throat> Never have. I thought maybe for one exciting minute that you were going to clarify it for me, but now I'm back to, well, we, we'll put that we on We have hold. a comment from a biblical scholar and then from a scientist here. Go ahead. Uh, just a minute. We'll, no, down here. The biblical scholar first. Oh, come on. Um, the first diet was the fruits. And then came the herbs. And then, after the flood, come the creatures. Right. Is there anything in between that would suggest anything different? I didn't read them all again. I don't have my Hebrew Bible with me. Um, that, because here he says, all of the animals, and then, to make it more complicated, we go to <coughs> Leviticus 11, and a bunch of the animals are not allowed. So we have an interesting progression of food. Well, to be fair, in the flood, you'll notice that there are clean animals and unclean animals, even though they're not specified as to which ones. Right. <coughs> and so I'm not sure that it ever progressed to the unclean animals. However, as you know, um, the unclean animals were eaten by various people. And, and so what is what God has specifically said okay um, has, not, has not always been followed by people post-flood, and I doubt that it was pre-flood either. That is possible, but it's, it's Leviticus 11 has this long list of these yes, these no. Right. And it, the diet <coughs> of people from the beginning I find extremely interesting, and it may have something to do with long life. Well, that's, um, there's certainly arguments from uh, the lifespan of vegetarians that, that might uh, support that. Uh, this raises a, a question that has been discussed. That <clears throat> there are those theologians, uh, especially in the eastern part of the uh, United States, who have taken the position that there was no death whatsoever uh, before sin. Uh, in the ideal world, uh, you wouldn't have anything die. Well, they, they're usually referring to animals because, it, as has been mentioned earlier, you know, we, you, you kill plants all the time. You know. uh, Adam probably walked on earthworms and may have killed one or two, and uh, you know, and the elephants walked on ants. And that story. Uh, <clears throat> but you get into a. Uh, I think we need to redefine more carefully what we mean when we say there was no death before sin because the thing gets a little bit more complicated uh, when you get into certain biological systems 
Uh, what are you going to do about the snakes, for instance? Uh, these things are designed for a carnivorous type of, uh, of uh, source of a food and so on, and then it, uh, they have a very complicated uh, jaw system, and they have the, the venom. Uh, that's one aspect we need to look at. There's another aspect we need to look at, and that is that there are certain organisms that seem to be designed for death. If you're going to say any animal that dies is death. And I would say a Venus flytrap, for instance, a very clever plant that, you know, just very suddenly will trap an insect and digest it. And then you've got uh, other, other systems that seem, you know, uh, very much designed to 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 involve death the, the the web of the spider for instance it traps insects and the spiders eat the insects uh, how did that come about in the whole picture uh, and then you can speak of the anteater for instance and it's it's you know a tremendously long tongue permits it to eat into, well, maybe there were other things that uh, some animals need a long tongue for, but uh, there are those things that are, and then to complicate the picture, uh, there are uh, animals that, or I should say organisms that live with each other and you get into parasites. And there are some Lichens, for instance, relationship with algae and fungus, this seems no problem with that. That seems nice. You get into tapeworms, you don't, it doesn't seem so nice. Uh, where did they come from? Uh, and you could say, well, degeneration is fine, except you get into certain parasites and you've got certain organs that are designed for at least a parasitic existence. Uh, Eucanthocephala parasites, they have this proboscis with spines on it so it can attach to the inside of the intestine. Uh, where did that come from? And, uh, but I, uh, I think uh, we, we do uh, wrong in saying there was no death before sin unless you are uh, going to exclude an awful lot of uh, organisms uh, from being involved in that death, uh, not just plants, but animals also. So we've we got several questions here that this raises. Uh, could genetic engineering be involved in some of this? Uh, it's, it's possible. Uh, I mean genetic engineering since creation. Uh, that is a possibility. Uh, is it possible that uh, parasitism was a uh, viable option, and that there were parasites that were nice? And to add to that picture, I would state very plainly, uh, uh, as you define a parasite, uh, I was a parasite on my mother during the first nine months of my existence. Uh, and I'm actually nine months older than people think I am. Uh, but anyway, uh, <laughs> I have already. <laughs> uh, so, so, uh, uh, but I, I, I think we, we need to, uh, when we look at something, how, who designed the spider web? Well, let's uh, st let's start with the snake because that that one I might even have some biblical answers. For. I, I I have yeah I'm I'm more comfortable with the snake. I'm I, I'm worried about the spider. <laughs> um, let's uh, let's start with the snake. The, the the evidence that we have from the biblical text, which is admittedly extremely meager, is that the snake, if anything, may have eaten fruit to start out with. And it probably had legs. Now, 
you can take some extra biblical stuff and try to have it have wings as well. Um, and um, uh, I think that um, I think you can argue that the snakes we have in the geologic record are post fall, and that by that time they had lost their legs. And that was the meaning of the curse. And upon your belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. Um, in fact, that may have implied a, a change in the snake's diet right from there. Uh, maybe there, uh, it wasn't the plants that they ate. Was they, they were cursed to eat animals at that point, too. Mm -hmm. In which case, they had some rather remarkable genetic engineering take place. Um, spiders are a little bit more difficult, although most of the time what they catch are insect, other insects. And so if you exclude insects from the Hebrew concept of moat, and it would be interesting to study the, the biblical text and see whether the, the word death is ever used for insects. I, to my knowledge, it's not, but I, I'll have to say... I haven't done a total word search. They're easy enough to do, by the way. Go to Blue Letter Bible, look up the word death, and uh, find all the biblical texts that have to do with death, and you can, you can look at them yourself. You don't have to wait till somebody who knows Hebrew does it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, uh, or you, you've got the yeah, mic yeah, first. Before. Yeah, like, does this work? Okay. I just have a couple of questions. I'm not quite on this subject, but uh, it seems like I read in the Bible that when Adam and Eve were um, expelled from the garden, that God had to take Adam aside and show him how to kill animals and make the skins into clothing. And then there's another irony. Cain and Abel were having um, sacrifices on their altar. One had a vegetarian, and the other one was animal. And it seemed like the one with the vegetarian was the one that killed the other, but it's just an irony. <laughs> but it, se it seems like <laughs> it seems like that the sort of read between the lines, they probably were eating this. They weren't just sacrificing like today, or, or at least through history, um, the priests used to eat the, the meat that was all offered to sacri for sacrifices. That is true, although it's never said. Uh, that's never said. In fact, it just simply says they got skins. Obviously, the animals that gave up the skins gave up the ghost at the same time. Uh, the other thing is that if you look through the universe, nothing is really permanent. You have stars that are born and then they die, and the black holes and everything. It's really inconceivable to think of man outlasting that if we would live forever. It's just something that's it's inconceivable to my mind. Well... It's unimaginable, perhaps, but I'm not sure it's inconceivable. Um, you were uh, making comment. Well, I, I think there's a couple ways you could look at this, uh, what the author's written here. Um, one of them could be, let's, let's look at the story of Genesis uh, as a description of what, of what is. And I don't think that's what he's attempting to do. I think he's saying, here's a narrative, and this narrative necessarily excludes certain other narratives, one of them being... Um, that in the beginning things evolved as we understand the theory of evolution. So I don't, I don't necessarily think that he's trying to, based on the fact that he's not defining what animal life is and so forth, describing in all detail whether or not there was or was not um, assimilation or consumption or death, however we would define that. I think he's trying to say, look, this narrative speaks in contrast to other narratives that they are mutually exclusive. They, they, they don't jibe in any way. I think that's the, that's the primary point as to whether or not the Bible speaks to these other issues of whether there is death at any level. I think we'd have to spend a lot more time looking at that. One of the things I'd want to know is what were the lines like um, before the fall? And I think the Bible speaks to that, and if it speaks to that, it would tell me that maybe the snakes were different, maybe the, the humans... Um, ability to assimilate food and so forth were different. Um, and it would be a completely different type of thing. I don't think the author's trying to address all of those details 
in this. And so some of the questions that have been raised, I think, are a little bit unfair given that. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's what's being attempted here. I could be wrong, but... Well, I, I think you're right about that. If, if they were going to address those kinds of questions, I think they would get somebody else to co-author with uh, Jacques Ducan, somebody who, whose experience with the animal world was a, a bit better. Because um, I, I imagine that uh, Jacques Ducan probably doesn't have uh, a higher biology degree. Yeah. A uh, question back here and a question here or so a comment here. The specific question I have is in that is in Genesis 129, uh, it's speaking about the herb bearing seed and the fruit of the trees. So, and, and then after, after, you know, the fall, then it says the herbs of the field are for you. Um, is, is there a clear distinction there that uh, the, the first diet is actually a diet that doesn't involve the death of individual plants, do, do the plants would continue to survive, it's just we're eating their seeds and, and the fruit, whereas... Because when you dig up the potatoes, the, the whole plant's gone. Right. Is, is the Bible clear? I mean, because I, I think that might be an important distinction in that if the Bible's describing the, describing the original diet of not even involving the death of plants in terms of the whole plant dying. You know. in, in, only plant tissues, so to speak. Right, right. But the plant continues to bear fruit and things like this. So, so even, it seems to me as though that is a non, it, that is a significant distinction between the diet before uh, sin, the diet after sin. And if, and if there is, if that is actually the correct interpretation of those texts, then it implies to me that the author is, is actually saying that life before sin entered didn't even involve the death of, of plants. You know, I think that you may be hitting on a point there. Uh, it was dulled slightly by the fact that the animals are allowed to eat the plants. That, that while humans were uh, restricted to the you know, fruits and nuts, if you want to call it that, fruits, probably grains. Right. But the implication is that we don't really do too much cultivation of grains either. Um, that that uh, when we start eating vegetables, we are actually eating now what the animals were eating before. So that the animals were eating up plants and possibly destroying the whole plant as well. Well, how do, how do we know that? Well, because the animals were given to eat the exact same thing that we were given to eat after the fall. So, I mean, could you have animals eating fruits and seeds? Well, you know, that's an interesting question because I'm not sure I can derive it from the biblical text. But you can argue that, for example, bats that uh, now eat insects may have eaten fruit originally, especially when you look at the fox bat, which has really, really good teeth for fruit eating and eats fruit. But they also happen to be really, really good teeth for eating uh, other creatures that, um, that have nervous systems in them. Well, if, if we allow um, a, a, a recreation at sin, if we allow that in an instant, you know, God spoke and the, the roses went from without thorns to having thorns, if, if, if we say that that's what happened, okay, then it seems to me as though we can speculate as to whether, you know, e exactly what slight change happened, but maybe big changes happened as well. Maybe, you know, things that now are purely carnivorous, well, in their pre-change state, that they were completely, you know, seed eating and fruit eating. Uh, I mean, there's really nothing, we, we shouldn't try to restrict God and say, well, we need to minimize what he's doing at this transition point. Yeah, can... the fruit bat actually ate leaves before. I mean... <laughs> yeah, I mean... But, but it seems to me as though... I, I, I think that this, this idea that in Genesis 1, if, it, if, it's really, if that diet really is a diet that doesn't even kill plants, it seems to me as though that's fairly significant and, and tells us that even plants didn't die and that the author is making that point. 
that the, the individual leaves might die, but the but, right. the, but the tree remained. Right. So the years, tree didn't die. Decades, centuries, whatever. Yeah. Uh, comment here, oh, and then we have one over here and one there. Go this ahead. is a bit of a troubling discussion for me. I will admit. Um, I think. 90% of what we're doing here is pure speculation. And God has not revealed these things to us. And death, he's the one that defines death. And uh, I like that point about maybe that we, we have a, such a limited, corrupted um, perspective on what the original creation was like, we have, we just have no conception. We or very no little. We have a no tiny, video of the garden. Tiny right. conception. And to think, you know, that lions couldn't, don't we talk about microevolution here in this class? Mm -hmm. A lot of things changed when, de when humans gave over their kingdom to the devil. He brought in even in parable, God, Jesus says, an enemy has done this. He brought in the, the poisonance, the poisons, the evil. As soon as, Ellen White says, as soon as Eve uh, ate of the fruit and they realized that they weren't being transported to some great wonderful concept beyond what God had offered them, then they they felt the chill in the air. And that's why they needed clothes. One reason, not, not the whole reason. Um, it was an immediate change. And, and it's been a few thousand years anyway. And so since then, I don't have any problem, maybe because I'm not a scientist and I'm not trying to figure all this out, but I think Sometimes we might just need to leave it in the hands of God, some of these questions, and trust him. Um, uh, Ariel Roth. <laughs> it's very interesting to me that in this whole conversation, we have totally ignored the curse. Cursed was the ground, cursed were the animals, everything. And you can't just now go back and say everything that is now applies to then because we're ignoring the curse. Amen. Well, we are, but there's one other thing. Uh, is that actually, or did you want it? He says, go ahead. Yeah, uh, just a point that you made about the uh, serpent. It's in Ellen White, not in the Bible, about the serpent being able to eat the fruit. Because she has this conversation going that extrapolates from the Bible and yeah. saying... But the Bible that, does have the serpent in the tree. Oh, yeah, yeah. And offering the fruit. And, um, and it doesn't take too much imagination to suggest that it might have eaten it. Let me read that while we're looking at it. Genesis 3, the serpent was more cunning... And any beast of the field said to the woman, so it's a speaking serpent. Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of every tree, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat it. Then the serpent said to the woman, you'll not surely die. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, did she see it was good for food based on watching the serpent eat? Or did That's she base it on her experience of tasting fruit on every other tree? Well, the truth of the matter is that is the text is not explicit. Yeah, that's the point and, I was making. And you can, you can read into it and without, without stretching it too much. On the other hand, you can read the text without having the serpent get its claw on the fruit yeah. and have the serpent simply talk Eve into it. Um, that emphasized the point that Sandy was just making, that we're doing a lot of extrapolation. And Ellen White also suggests that it may be innocent 
in our rela studying the relation of science and religion may be innocent to uh, speculate as long as our final conclusions agree with the word of God. And I that's think, the test, I think the that's, final that's, test. That's an important point is that the Bible does give, give us a kind of a limit to the, extra, uh, the extrapolation it it that people can make. It has boundaries. It has boundaries. And I, I think that one of the boundaries that is there, and Jacques Dukan is pointing it out correctly, is that as the Bible sees death, certainly as the Genesis writer sees death, death doesn't exist in the original Genesis account. The death comes in as a curse, and specifically human death, mm -hmm. comes in as a curse uh, for eating the fruit. Mm -hmm. And I, I, th I think that, uh, that it's interesting to try to see if what we can put together with what we know now, although we have to be careful because, you know, in Isaiah it speaks about the lion that will eat straw like the ox, implying that it's not going to eat gazelles. Um, and, you know, it's in the passage where it talks about the, uh, where it talks about the uh, child putting his hand in the asp's hole. And everybody knows what happens when you do that here. Um, and that kind of suggests that there's a, uh, there is, the, the, the standard way of things dying does not exist then. And it implies that, I, th I think it's, I think Dukan is right, that it implies that the original didn't have that either. And we know the serpent itself was cursed. There's no question about that. It went from walking around on presumably all fours, maybe all twos, it's not clear, down to uh, crawling on its belly. And paleontology does support that, as you mentioned. There are now found old, very, very old fossil skeletons of snakes with legs. Now, whether they were strong enough to support the animal, or maybe it just assisted in crawling or used in reproduction or some other thing, but they did have um, legs, four of them. Just in connection with that, uh, uh, there are rare occasions of snakes that have legs on them, that you, uh, present living snakes. Uh, there are rare cases of dolphins that develop leg buds. There are rare cases of uh, large whales developing rudimentary legs where they're supposed to develop. And this all point seems to point to probably a simple fact that the, there is a basic vertebrate plan and that animals from that basic plan have been modified. But the, the genes for producing legs are in the snakes. They're there. They're suppressed. And, uh, but occasionally the system doesn't work and the, snakes, and the legs show up. Uh, and I, I have no problem whatsoever with that, that we, God used a basic plan, why, why not? Uh, and then modify it for different organisms. You know, I'm going to make one other suggestion. And that is that this actually uh, presents a scientific research pro program. And, and that is that if everything was created perfect, and if at least uh, deleterious parasitism was not part of the original plan, then it suggests that all parasites should be able to be um, traced back to a free-living ancestor by degeneration. And that, for example, we should find roundworms in the soil and hookworms in people 
and the hookworms should be mostly missing genes, gene systems. And it would be interesting to have somebody do a full hookworm uh, genome and compare it with a roundworm genome and see if, in fact, that can be demonstrated. Because if it can, then you have a biblical uh, uh, description that can be used positively as a scientific research program. I, I just might add, uh, in the study of legs in uh, animals that aren't supposed to have them, in the seals, I believe it is seals, anyway, it's, it's dolphin seal group. They've studied the early embryology and a leg bud appears right where it's supposed to and then it disappears. Uh, they even, you know, the, the, they have the suggestion there that uh, in the embryology, this thing is, is there as part of the basic system. And, it, it, and you can see it. These are just little bumps, actually bumps, just in the right place where the legs are supposed to develop, and then it's suppressed. Uh, one more comment here, and we'll probably call it a day. I think we, we sort of struggle with, with this issue because we uh, live in a world in which uh, the biological systems are just so based upon selfishness. Um, and so it's hard for us to sort of struggle and imagine what a, a, bi a biology would be like when the fundamental principle of the biology before the fall would be, I think, basically service to other, probably other species. Basically symbiosis. Yeah, like through top to bottom throughout the entire, you know, categorization of all, of all, you know, life. Uh, and um, I think that in, in the Earth Restored, I think we're going to, the biologists are just going to have an absolute field day because it's going to be not only just a whole new systems to study, but the, in, the relationship between species uh, is probably going to be no less complex than, than you know, the, the, the mechanisms in place are going to be no less complex than what we have today. And yet, in the process of studying those systems to see how the design is for one species to serve another, uh, it, it, I think would be, for biologists, would be just an absolute delight and, and would cause them to, to totally praise God because every, everything that they study would be, you know, this is just such an amazing design. Whereas now we're left with so much, well, this is an amazing design that God, you know, did because to, to help these things survive, you know, in, in a sinful world. Um, but imagine studying, it would almost be like a whole new biology to study uh, in, in the new earth. Well, a lot of the tight controls that would keep things symbiotic could be damaged to where one species became um, more parasitical and the other became more of a host and had to fight against the parasite just to survive. And so now you're having conflict, whereas before you had uh, cooperation in it. And the cooperation is tougher to make. And so I, I agree with you. I think that the Biology was even more complex before the fall and will probably be even more complex than that after uh, the restoration as well. <coughs> anyway, come back next um, week and we'll discuss. Uh, some people take uh, tapeworms in order to lose weight. There's a cooperation. <laughs> <laughs>